Hello! Battery's running low, so we're just gonna chug right along. Uh, two chapters today, and that would be the Ministry for Magic and the Hearing. Oddly enough, these chapters combined are just about the same length as the single following chapter, which is weird because these are actually some crucial moments for us. Well, maybe not the Ministry of Magic. Uh, that is really there to set up, again, the end game we're looking at where we invade the Ministry, but also then the overall end game. There are actually some hints here of what will occur in Deathly Hollows. Most notably, the one that popped up for me was the fact that Arthur points out that weather control spot, the, the people that decide what weather we have, to Harry, which doesn't matter at all here, but is going to matter in the future when Ron is actually masquerading as a gentleman working from that department. Yeah, yeah, no, th there are hints of what's going to occur throughout this. There are also hints of how sort of all of this is being treated. There is really this bureaucracy that most of us are just functioning through and just dealing with it. Blah, blah, blah. Like, there's, there's memos, and you have to go through this checkout, and you have to wear the little name badge, and no one's really paying attention to you until they are because you're famous. And there's all these departments, and if you look, the, all the departments are, are really odd, but really specific, and everything has its own little box, and everything's got to fit in its little box. And we have boxes to handle, the boxes that don't fit, like the fire-breathing chicken. And we got the little memos, because owls are too messy. Like, it really is sort of... Box everything in, and we can make sense of it. But then there's also this overarching mythology that the Ministry has, that you see um, in the, the little statue that we have, which is most notably the wizard. The witch is actually smaller. Um, but but they're both there, and then we have a goblin, and a house elf, and a centaur who are all sort of like, ah, like this, this is the mythology we have, uh, where we know that <laughs> the goblins and the centaurs definitely aren't like, ah, and from what we've seen with the house elves, they're certainly powerful enough that if they, they want to do something, they're going to do something. So, this, this mythology that we're seeing, and all the little boxes of everyone fits into the little boxes, is really that. It's a mythology. It's the Ministry trying to act like they have control of everything, when in fact uh, we are seeing pretty much everything else that doesn't fit into these little boxes. We are so used to having such a messy world, where everything's mixed together, and you've got good guys and bad guys, and people in the gray, and resurrection, and ghosts, and death, and life, and all of this really messy stuff that we can't put into boxes. And then we meet the ministry where they're attempting to, and we're seeing that they are falling short. We actually see that they have to fake their way through it. Like, they recognize the only way they're taking this kid down is if they try and make him so that he is late, uh, that he has no defense, that no one's there to back him up. Uh, they try and basically threaten him by showing him, ah, look, you have all the power here and it's just you, instead of this one-on-one -on -one that he was expecting. It is an entire, like, full Wizardmagon trial where they skipped the time ahead three hours and try and blame him. Well, it's not our fault. We sent you an owl. <laughs> like, they are trying to keep this mythology going, but the only way they can do it is through really petty means. And they just seem so incompetent, uh, particularly against Dumbledore. We suddenly have Dumbledore come in, who... The thing with this is, do not 
get down to a fool's level, they will beat you with experience. Harry gets to the point where he wants to just yell and scream, and the thing is, he can't do that because then the Ministry will beat him with the, their own experience of being able to be petty. Like, the snap questions, which is not just fudge. Amelia Bones does it too. Like, not even giving a chance to explain, just yes, 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 no, yes. It is the thing that the people feared Socrates for, is his ability to make the weaker argument the stronger simply by not allowing you to explain what you mean fully and just getting you onto this single track that's going to lead where he wants to go. This is an argument leveled against Socrates, even by modern standards, and we are seeing that the Ministry has perfected it. They are going to just chug him through, and that's the interesting thing is, is that Dumbledore now has had a fight on this plane while still remaining aloof from it. He is actually balancing this fight the Ministry the way they're treating this argument, and somehow still being above that, which is to set out, okay, either the Dementors were out of control, the Ministry control, or they had been sent. And neither of those is going to make the Ministry look good. So again, he's he's limiting it down, and he's he's funneling them into these choices, we also happen to know that they are the correct ones, and we like to think that Dumbledore wouldn't do this if they were, in fact, incorrect. But with the Ministry and Dumbledore both doing it, it's hard to make that judgment. Who's really got this binary going on? Both of them. There are multiple choice, uh, answers here. And Dumbledore is simply going for the most logical one. And thank God most of the like, the trial agrees with him on that. And we get funneled down into these very logical choices, yet somehow again, Dumbledore isn't being petty about it. He's got this way of speaking that allows for mistakes to have been made without him fully blaming, like, a single person in regards to who's made that mistake. We know, of course, that he's looking at Fudge going, <laughs> And that's because, again, Fudge has dragged this entire thing down to this fisticuffs level, and Dumbledore simply going, okay, you want to fight politics? I'll fight politics. And Dumbledore beats him with experience. And, and Harry can't do that. He doesn't have the experience to beat anybody in this moment, and being faced with that, of course, is getting him frustrated. Even more frustrating for Harry is the fact that Dumbledore won't look at him. Like, that's the interesting thing with Dumbledore, is, is even he isn't without fault. He understands how to do this political balancing act, but he doesn't quite seem to have the personal balancing act. If you're willing to talk to this kid before and then you suddenly sh shut him out, an explanation would be good. Harry doesn't seem to have done anything that warrants this. And in fact, Dumbledore does seem to be backing him, so for Harry, Dumbledore's trying to have it both ways. And that simply doesn't work. Either back me or you don't. But if you're going to back me, explain what's going on. How difficult would it be to send Harry a letter that says, I have to remain aloof from you this year with everybody looking at me, but I believe you and I will continue to support you in the ways that I can. If you don't want to explain to him that, yeah, I'm pretty sure you have a connection to Voldemort and I don't want you to possess... I don't want him to possess you or me through that connection, so I won't look at you. Even if you don't want to explain that, which I think might be good to explain anyways, but again, if you don't want to explain that, at least reassure the kid that you haven't just abandoned him. Like, it's a good plan to just reassure this kid. Which, the thing is, everybody is sort of doing it on the surface level, but the surface level isn't helping. You can see through the surface level. 
and you're dropping enough hints that tell him there is something going on deeper than that surface level that he's just like, okay, cool, you don't trust me. And Dumbledore's suspicious behavior here, actions that he has never done towards Harry before in ignoring him, but still somehow backing him, is going to mean that Harry is less and less likely to bring his issues to adults. Because you know what? You're either going to tell me that I'm overreacting, or you're going to overreact and tell me that I don't need to handle this because I'm a kid. You're not going to assist me in handling this. So, can... can squibs see Dementors? I don't think so, but they can certainly feel them. Uh, does Umbridge need to get punched in the face? Certainly. She remains confident through this entire thing because she's well aware that she's going to Hogwarts hereafter. So if we can't take Harry down here, we'll take him down in other ways. Amelia... That's the interesting thing is you get a lot of people who are just like, yeah, Amelia's cool. But she seems to be so wrapped up into the bureaucracy again that she can't really do anything active. I mean, she'll get into the position of Minister for Magic and then, and then she gets assassinated. Kinsley and Arthur's exchange is pretty humorous. If you had bothered to read my report, you would know the term is firearms. <laughs> so, I mean, with these chapters, as serious as they are, Rowling is allowing for this to actually be real life. This could occur, but when something bad happens, it doesn't constantly stay bad. There are always going to be moments that are actually very funny, very poignant moments, very personal moments, uh, like what we're seeing here. So, oddly enough, the thing I walked away from, despite all of these negatives, was Kinsley and Arthur try acting like they don't know each other and, and <laughs> Arthur inviting Kinsley over for supper. We need to be able to look at the good times, even as we evaluate the negatives. Because we can't just write our entire world off. There's got to be something worth it here, and I think that little moment of friendship that is key. And that was included for a reason. Okay, I'm gonna keep reading, and I hope you do too. See you next time.